Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Joseph, uh, the Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, so just uh, before we begin, Father, just uh, has asked that uh, just to remind you, there's plenty of uh, resources on this topic that we are going to cover this uh, coming year on the family. Um, and just to uh, sort of give you a, also an encouragement that district-wide, we, we do see that there are, there have been uh, a lot of, um, we might say, on our part, we do realize as priests worldwide in the society and in the world that we sort of are losing the cultural battle uh, with our families, our children. Uh, and we see the onslaught against our faithful uh, with the spirit of the world. Um, and our plan of attack to help you with all this is to give um, what I've asked our superiors for years and years and years. Finally, we've uh, got some support, and that is the superiors have decided to uh, come up with a plan of formation for the faithful and for our younger age uh, students because there's no, no point in starting to talk to them about marriage, the family, the faith, once they finish high school, because by then they've either made up their mind to keep the faith or more often lost the faith. So our plan of attack is to give retreats starting, you know, recollection from year uh, six and seven onward for the, for the teachers to form them as Catholic teachers because just because you go to a traditional Catholic school, it doesn't mean that the school is Catholic or you're learning a, a Catholic formation. So that and also in, in practice, we are we've set up a committee of of uh, IT geeks of the priests and uh, some lay people who are going to help us f work together to put out flyers, booklets on uh, the battle for addictions on the internet, social media, and to try and get it into the hands to give you the tools that you need, uh, both professional and um, pastoral that you need to help you with these things, which are affecting all of our families, all of our parishes. Uh, so we, we are working on that. Uh, Father Thiemann, God bless him, next week is already going to, to Goulburn to give a few days recollection for the boys and then later the following week, the girls uh, at St. Philomena's. So, and, you know, the nuns, they often go up to our schools to get the children at a younger age uh, to give them that formation. And, uh, you know, recently we had the, the marriage uh retreat weekend and father asked me to come and assist and I thought man uh, all these older people uh, were there and I thought what about what a, what a big waste of time uh, because there's some of these people could be giving me <laughs> uh, advice but I, I I was wrong about that I realized a lot of them were um, not formed properly and they really got a lot out of it and they were able to, um, if not go back and, and recollect and, you know, improve their marriages. But I think at least they were able to make up in the gaps what they were often not taught. And, uh, you know, nowadays when people come for, tell us they want to be married, it is the marriage instructions are obligatory. Um, and, and that is giving them the Catholic mindset of what is expected of them in the mind of the church. Because what was once taken for granted is unfortunately no longer imparted. Uh, and, and But this talk today is not just on um, uh, the, the marriage. It is on the whole question, and I'm going to give some analogies, of uh, vocation in general. Uh, uh, but what we want to understand uh, is firstly that we have to have a proper understanding, and that is given to us uh, by God and, and his church. And what Father wants to Primarily, the purpose of this first conference is to remind us that marriage is for our sanctification. And I think we have lost sight of that concept. And that becomes harder and harder as the world becomes more secular and godless and debased. That becomes harder for us to, to grasp. And we're going to see um, 
uh, what is the mindset and how do, how do we form ourselves in this? Uh, the first uh, principle is that uh, vocation, marriage or religious, requires of us a spirit of sanctification, a spirit of uh, sacrifice. Uh, God is calling us in marriage or in the religious life to a life of selflessness. It's not about me. Uh, it's about God and the person that God has called me to serve. That is a very foreign concept uh, for us today. Uh, in the religious life, you know, we have the, the vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the, the marriage have this in a similar way, but not in the same, not in the same way. Uh, the church has always taught us that, you know, we have the, the seven sacraments, but one of the sacraments is marriage. And that sacrament is there, is, uh, has taken a natural contract between a man and a woman, uh, and elevated it to a supernatural order, which means it comes with it, uh, supernatural graces to help us to fulfill that vocation, to fulfill that state. So the religious life is not necessarily a, a sacrament, even if the, the priesthood is, but that priesthood brings with it uh, the graces that the priest is going to need to look after the parish, his family, the, the, the lay people. Uh, so likewise in the, the marriage. And today, you know, as Sister Lucy said, uh, the last battle is going to be fought over marriage and the family. And you see uh, it's attacked on, on every level, even to the minute level of, of biological, you know, what is a male, what is a female. Um, you know, they obviously they do know what a male and a female is, but they attack this very basic foundation because this is the basic foundation of reality. And if you, you can't grasp reality, well, grace builds on nature, destroy nature, then grace has no effect. And this is the demonic way of, of basically shutting souls out from the, the reach of the grace of God uh, uh, by perverting the very nature of which God has made and, and uh, uh, undermining that nature. And that's what we are seeing today. So this, uh, if we are lost even on the very fundamental level of nature uh, and the very purpose of why I'm here, then you're going to struggle in uh, determining uh, your vocation in life, uh, trying to even live uh, with someone. And I, I think really marriage today is getting harder and harder because we have been brought up from the day uh, we are born to think my life is about me. Uh, and the concept, uh, and you see this even in our parishes, that why do we have so few vocations today? Uh, when we had 10, 20 years ago, more vocations uh, with less schools, less parishes, because of this concept that the world has put into the hearts and minds of people, that my life is about me. Whereas in the past, we understood the life is about laying down my life. I lay down my life. And that's why our Lord says, he who will save his life in this world uh, will lose it. He who will lay down his life and this, lose his life in this world for me shall gain it. That concept is lost today. We, the struggle, the concept for somebody to think of making a commitment terrifies them. Religious life or even married life, we, we know this, terrifies them. Uh, and, and again, the more and more we become selfish, the more we become self-focused, that becomes very difficult for a lot of people. And a lot of people enter the religious life and the, the married life based on a, a delusion, uh, an illusion. And you, you see this. I, they see their, their future spouse and, and the woman often uh, says, oh, I will change him. Oh, that's never going to happen. Okay, um, but, but it's an illusion. I, they're often in love more with the idea of the romantic idea, and, and, and today the whole world is full of um, everything is promoted in such a very lovely romantic way that you actually start to think that that's real life. Uh, real life, everyone, everything's fine and everything's dandy and, and people just get along because the people are just lovely. It's just the way they are. And reality is we know that's not true. Um, and, and that illusion uh, becomes our foreground for entering into something which is based upon, traditionally, the actual crucifixion of ourselves, not the actual glorification of ourselves. And, and this is for us very difficult. So when, when the difficult to do's do come, they start to become uh, very terrified. You see, the, the abundance today, super abundance of divorces, priests leaving the, the priesthood, 
the religious, leaving the religious life. What was it based on? Well, that, that's part of the problem. That's not the whole problem. We'll see more. But it is part of the problem. Uh, and what we want to do today is uh, try to disillusion you from that. And last week I gave a sermon about Christ was a realist. He, he was very blunt about, if you saw last week's gospel, so related to what I'm saying today, our Lord kept telling the apostles, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be put to death, they're going to beat me, they're going to spit on me, and then they're going to crucify me. And it's like they didn't want to hear it. Like they didn't, it just didn't fit in. And when our Lord tried to convince them, St. Peter says, that'll never going to happen. And our Lord says, get behind me. He said, the point is, our Lord is a realist. Our faith is realistic. And it gets, it wants us to confront things we just don't want to confront. We don't want to hear. Um, and it, it, it's not in conformity to our nature because it's supernatural. And even on this point, I say to anyone who's outside the Catholic Church that one big difference between us and you is that your religion is human and naturalistic. Ours is divine and supernatural. Uh, only a supernatural religion would make a supernatural demand of you that you're bound to one wife for life, one husband for life, and that you have religious, the leaders of your religion, are uh, celibate. That's not human. Uh, 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 human religion is Islam. Uh, uh, it's all about the flesh, the world, yourself, uh, the ego, the, the male pride. That's, that's the worldly religion. Our Lord's challenge is supernatural. And this is for us becoming harder and harder with the, with the false ideas the world promotes for us. We are not here to make a job, a career, uh, a place for ourselves. And, you know, I saw two different clips recently, and they both give you a very in interesting insight. Um, uh, so one of them is quite beautiful. So one clip was uh, a woman, she's making um, a, a cup of drink uh, for her and uh, her spouse. And she, she pours the, the cup for her spouse, and it's full, and there's not a lot of drink left, so she pours the, the what's left in her cup, and she adds in her cup some water. She takes over the the clip, no, sorry, takes over the cups to, to both uh, her and her husband, and gives her husband the one that's full of juice. And her husband, as she's put them down uh, to sit herself down, he switches the cups, and he gives her the one full of juice, and uh, he drinks the one that's um, watered down. And she takes a sip, and she understands. And that's a beautiful man, a man who's laying down his life and he's noticed, paid attention to the sacrifice of his wife, but he embraces the sacrifice. Little, little statement, little insignificant thing, but that's a man who's laid down his self, ego and, and value for the other. Now another clip showed a whole group of, of modern day women in their 30s and 40s who have all the most brilliant skills, talents, professionals, they're uh, wealthy, successful, but they're all lonely, they're all unhappy because they gave their lives to the spirit of the world and they're empty. And, they, uh, and when, they, when they should have, and we're going to see this later on, when they should have been building themselves up and, uh, for virtue, for what God has called them to do, uh, they, they were doing what? Walking around uh, in, 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 in dressed badly, uh, their focus was worldly. Uh, they have nothing to offer marriage. And when they do finally wake up, well, you reap what you sow. The poison of the world offers a glamour, but at the end of the day, it gives you a bitterness. And that's, that's what you are seeing today. A lot of people, in fact, really, so many countries in the world today, a lot of people not only not married, but they, they're going to have a big uh, uh, population problem in a few years because this whole self-focus uh, today has meant that most people don't get married. Uh, and their focus is not on the, giving them life to God in the religious life, nothing. And at the end of the day, they are empty. They, have, they may have all the material uh, successes that the world has to offer, but you know that goes to show a point that I'm going to go into more detail, that the world and with all its material benefits, we are not going to be happy. It doesn't give us the happiness that uh, we are looking for. When it comes down to choosing our vocation, we have to ask ourselves the first and foremost question. What does God want of me? What does God want of me? Not even what I want, what I like. What is God asking of me and of my life? 
And that, that's not an, always an easy question. Uh, but what God does expect us to do is to do what our duty is to do. Do what God expects you to do and God will open doors or close doors according as he, he wants. Uh, but you have a duty, whatever you, you're seeking to someone to marry, I like this person. But the fact that you like that person should never be, never be the defining factor of should I marry this person. And there's a distinction here between can I marry this person and may I marry this person. It's a very important distinction. It's like can I kill my dog and should I kill my dog? They're not the same thing. Uh, you physically can do something, yeah, you can do it. But should you do it is another thing. Yeah, I can marry this person, but should I marry this person? Is this person, uh, is this state of life going to help me actually save my soul? As this is what I am called for. Am I called to be with this person? This, And when I'm called to be with this person, or just like when I'm called to be in this religious vocation, it's to the exclusion of all others. And that, that in our modern world is very hard to make that determination and that sacrifice to commit to either one of a priesthood or religious life or uh, to this one person to the exclusion of everyone else. That's becoming harder and harder. But that has to be our focus uh, when we're addressing this question. Uh, our first focus must be my life has to be a reflection to some degree of the life of Christ. And that's an interesting point because St. Thomas Aquinas says every single sacrament in the Catholic Church was instituted to bring us closer to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. He says that also includes marriage, to deepen our union with our Lord through the bond of marriage. Every sacrament is there to deepen our union with Christ. So so when you're choosing a spouse, when you're choosing a vocation, is this going to actually deepen... um, my union with Christ. If it's not, then you're on the wrong path. It, it doesn't matter uh, what you think you've chosen. And you're going to see, if you have a proper concept of vocation, both lives, the religious life and the married life, they both have an aspect of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the church has always taught this. So the poverty in the married life is actually, once you get married, your address spiritually changes. Your life is no longer about you and the things that you have, well, it's no longer yours. I remember recently someone saying to me, oh, so how do you determine in your fridge, Father, who, what belongs to who? And I just, my, there was a, I was a bit stunned. I thought, well, no, it belongs to everybody. It's, it's not my house. It's, uh, it's God's house and it belongs to everybody. <laughs> it's for everyone. We don't have such thing as this is mine and this is yours. It doesn't exist in the religious life. It's for everybody. Uh, same thing in your life as ma- married. Uh, you, you, your concept of what I, I do, what I spend my money on, it, you've got to start thinking, well, now it's no longer just my personal money. It's the family money, and I have to be cautious. Yeah, okay, you can uh, uh, buy some stuff for yourself. Like There's this uh, joke where the, the guy says to his wife, honey, why are you spending all that um, money on the makeup? It's very expensive. And uh, and she says, I'm doing it to make myself look beautiful for you. For you. And she says to, to him, he responds, well, well, the alcohol was doing that. <laughs> so, but, but, but the point, the point is, we, we, um, everything you do once you're, and it's the same thing in the religious life. Everything you do when you go shopping or when you, when you do, it, it, your focus is now no longer myself, okay, the community, even when I go out somewhere, well, I've got to be back for, for, for prayers or for, for something or I've got to respond to somebody. I, I've got to prepare a schedule. So your, whole, your time is no longer yours. Your life is no longer about you. And that, that, that's tough. That's hard. Because what, once you get married, you promise to live a common life with this one person. You promise to be there basically for the meals, uh, for, on time for things. They have a right to expect you there. Uh, they have a right to expect that. Um, just like my, my superiors have a right to expect me, uh, in, in, in all, uh, give and take, to be there for, uh, for uh, meals, for a regular life. We live a life in common. We don't live on our own. It's not about me. It's a life of community. So the same thing in the married life. You, you lay down your life to sacrifice yeah, your, your time with others. And the, 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 the days with hanging out with the mates, well, it's good. And the, there's a time and place for it, but that should be slowly drifting away now is the is the family uh, and obviously you know the 
that it's like the sisters live a harder life than us priests when it comes to the poverty they literally don't own anything and they basically have to ask permission from their superior if they can spend even five dollars harder for them than it is for us archbishop lefebvre said if i point, if i impose that on the priest they wouldn't be able to function because they've always got to travel they've got to constantly call the superior can i buy a hamburger it would be ridiculous uh, it would be unfair so he said okay they they can spend any of their personal money within reason on not everything uh, because they also have to still have a spirit of poverty and that uh, that whole spirit of poverty unfortunately is, is lost today amongst so many of our people it's such a wasteful society throwaway society um, you know and these our beautiful sisters they will use the same piece of cling rack like 50 times uh, but maybe that's excessive but the point is that beautiful sense of no everything is important everything has a value everything is to be respected um, we we consider everything because it's not just about us um, and, and we can value things that spirit of poverty is lost we live in a wasteful throwaway society that values almost nothing and and that's a sad thing because we have to work to reinstill that in ourselves and in our children uh, that aspect of chastity we should be clear in the religious but the religious makes that sacrifice uh, for a higher deed, for a higher thing, for God, for the love of God, and to draw closer to God. And the, 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 the married, they have a life of chastity that they uh, choose to, and this is very difficult, they choose to uh, marry this one person in exclusion to everyone else. And, it's, and again, don't let Hollywood um, deceive you in the sense that this is the only person I could ever be attracted to. That's not true. Huh? Uh, people by nature can be attracted to a million people. Uh, and, and you see this. Why is that? Because no, no one person on a natural level, no one person will ever satisfy you. That's a reality. Uh, if you're talking on a purely physical level, that's not possible. You could have a trillion people. Because the human heart has, has an aspect, when I say the human heart, that is the spiritual aspect of man, has an aspect of the infinite and you see this with greedy people uh, greed there's no like food you can only eat so much before you get sick whereas money if you ask someone when is enough never never is enough you could have a trillions and trillions and trillions of never enough ask the banks how much uh, is enough never keep going rob the people who cares that greed is infinite because the spirit of man is so uh, has that aspect of infinite that no one person is actually going to satisfy you and that's why yeah marriage it is a big sacrifice. And again, uh, realistic, when, uh, when our Lord says to the apostles, a person who puts away their, their wife and takes another commits adultery, in hearing this, St. Peter says, oh, beautiful, I always wanted to. No, he says, disaster. It's better, if that's the case, they're better not to get married. Uh, and he was married. <laughs> uh, it, it, so he understood. Uh, it's very difficult if that's the case. Um, and, and one of the reasons why God in the Old Testament allowed them this aspect of marriage and divorce is what was happening under Moses is, okay, can't divorce my wife, that's all right. I'll find a way to kill her. And that's what they were doing. They were killing their wives. So God said better than them just going around secretly killing their wives, uh, allow them for the hardness of their hearts so as to protect these innocent uh, people. Uh, men uh, are savage. Uh, only God's grace can make uh, us stay together with all of our faults. Uh, we we have to be realistic about that. Not not easy. So God is realistic that w when you are um, uh, getting married, it is a sacrifice. It is a big sacrifice. Uh, you, and you, and I'm not saying that you don't love this person. You do, but you also at the same time having to say, now I exclude everyone else uh, from that choice for life. It's a commitment for life. Like in the good old days, religious understood that once they were ordained, uh, once you took your final vows, unless some miracle or, or some, some other major reality, you were, you were committed for life. It was a lifelong commitment. Uh, that was a sacrifice you made. And you know what? You may not feel happy in that life, but once you're ordained, you actually accept the sacrifice uh, that you promised God before the altar. That's why the sacrifice, the promise, the vow that you make is so serious because you made it to God uh, with full reason. Uh, today, uh, and again, I don't want to offend anybody here, but you know the, 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 the trillions and trillions of, and I use the word trillions, 
of annulments. And the greater bulk of them, the greater bulk of them today are not valid in the sense that, and I'm not judging the Vatican, but what I'm saying is the real canonical basis for it is the joke. It's an insult to our Catholic concept of marriage is for life. That's a very sad reality. Uh, and, and, and to prove you that point, the people often who apply for an omen, they were happy to be married to this person as long as they were happy. But the day they're not happy, they want to leave. Oh, I, I've been married 10, 20, 30 years. Oh, maybe my marriage wasn't valid. Why all of a sudden it wasn't valid? Because now I don't like the person. How is that? How is that um, a, a solid basis for uh, 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 destroying a real marriage? It's not. So again, you see this, but you see that, again, the modern church is catered to the evil spirit of the, the modern world in which modern men, modern Catholics, um, have basically succumbed to. And it's basically God giving them uh, leaders according to their own desires, like God did in the Old Testament, nothing new. Uh, and then the, the whole question of uh, religious obedience. And the obedience today is, is harder and harder. For two reasons. One, often those who rule are perverted. And they often have, they themselves have a false concept of authority, which makes it hard. And I, just before I, I, I um, gave this, uh, giving this talk, a friend of mine called me and he asked me something. I said, listen, I think today we have a, so the church has always taught that, you, that as a Catholics, we can overthrow a tyrannical uh, authority, right? is meant by tyranny is not what we think. We think a dictator who's killing people. No. Mind of the church, a tyrant is somebody who governs for their own interest. Our government today governs for its own interest. It's not interested in the common good. It's all about self. Can uh, the church, can, does the church say we would have the authority to topple it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Presuming that in toppling it, we don't create a greater disaster. That's why uh, in the time of Hitler, the, the church authorities gave, gave the lay people the authority. Yes, you can topple Hitler. Yes, you can put him to death. As long as you have a backup plan, that is not going to create anarchy. Why? Because this man uh, is wicked and it, it serves the common good in toppling the wicked. And, and again, the part of the problem today is like you see with our modern day governments, that they think that to authority is about themselves and self-rule. And that is false. And I think the very... First example I gave you of that man with the cup, beautiful example of ruling, leading is not about myself. But it also means that we, we grow up with a self-warped concept of authority and it becomes harder for us to, to govern. Uh, so one of our priests, Father, was telling me, great priest, but he said, you know, he struggled to lead others. And when he would get upset with the, someone, he would go to the, the younger students or the, the younger priests and say, Go and correct that uh, seminarian. Otherwise, if I go, I'm going to blast them. Um, so he understood it's, it's not easy to govern. It's not an easy thing. Um, so we have to first be able to govern ourselves. And I'm going I'm to come back to that point. But it is not easy uh, to uh, be obedient because our concept today, all of us are tainted with this, our concept today is our obedience comes down to whether I like the guy, uh, uh, whether I think they're good, uh, doesn't have to, I might not like the person, but they still remain my legitimate superior. And anything that is not contrary to faith or reason, I have, I have a due um, uh, respect to obey that command. It's not against your faith, morals, or, or, or reason. Uh, so it's just you go and stand on your head. Obviously, that's not irrational and unreasonable. But as long as it's not against those three things, then we do have a due duty to, to submit. But I, I will say, I even find that concept of obedience um, superficial. The real concept of obedience is the example I gave you in the very beginning with that clip. The, the man was considerate of his wife and the wife was considerate of the husband. So I, I don't need to ask my superior many things because I know how they think. I live with them. I, I, I know their mind. Uh, so I, I can anticipate their mind uh, for things and do them because the, I know how they think. I know what they would expect. So we can do with each other. That's somebody who's laid down his will. I, I, I might not like it. I might not agree. I might think it's great. But I don't know that that is, that is what they would want. So I try and conform my mind so that we operate as one heart and one mind working together for the good, not of uh, the individual, not my good, 
not even his personal good, the good of the whole. And that, that is a concept of, of marriage and religious life that the church has always tried to instill in us. You know, Father spoke to you before about the whole concept of the, the five love languages, trying to find uh, the way to reach the other, trying to find a way that when, when you, as a superior, uh, you commit the, you try to, you, you know your subjects, those under you, you want them to obey. Well, you've got to find a way to reach them in a way that is according to them. So St. Paul says, become all things to all men in order to gain all men. So with the child, you, you've got to be a bit childish in the sense that you, you, you talk to them at their level. You, you communicate at, at their level in order to elevate them, to bring, to bring them up. So the same thing with those under you. You have to rule, govern according to uh, their, uh, the way that's going to be receptive for them and they're going to profit from uh, uh, your authority. If they are going to feel, and it's a bit like a bit like gardening. I think gardening is the best example. So w- w- gardening, you, you've got your plant, whatever, but you know it's going to need water, it's going to need sunshine, it's going to need fertilizer. But there are some plants, that may, particularly like the roses, that don't need fertilizer. If you put too much fertilizer or water, give them too much attention, they won't grow and they'll die. They just want mud and they just want plain dirt and leave us alone and we'll flourish by ourselves. And, and, and that's the same thing with people. Some you've got to input more, some input less, some you've got to give more direction, others less. And it, It's an art. It's an artwork in knowing how to lead, to guide. you got to learn first to lead and guide yourself. Uh, so, But in both, both states... You're going to be governed, um, and we we have to learn now to obey our parents, our teachers, our priests, as we want to one day be obeyed uh, by others. We have to be uh, the good subject now, and that's again, that's not an easy thing uh, in our modern world. Marriage starts at the altar. Uh, the priest is consecrated in the, in the altar. You get married before the foot of the cross. It's about uh, the cross. not about suffering, uh, but it is a life of sacrifice. And if you enter like that, you enter it right. If you don't enter it like that, you're in for a big uh, disappointment. Uh, you know, I, I had a friend of mine in the seminary. He, he, uh, he wasn't the brightest in the seminary. Uh, he was, I think, a year ahead of me. But on his mirror, he just put up, he covered the mirror and he put a piece of paper. And he wrote there, why am I here? He often failed many of his tests. Uh, but every day he looked at that piece of paper, well, it's not because I'm the smartest, not because I'm getting good grades, but I came here to serve God. Uh, if I get humiliated with bad grades and I'm not that bright, that's all right. Uh, he got ordained, still a very good, solid priest. Uh, he understood, why am I here? It's not about uh, looking smart, getting a high position. It's about why I came here. I came to serve God. And if God doesn't give me the brains, that's all right. Um, doesn't matter. It's not important. What God is giving me the ability to stay focused on why I came. Marriage, you might have a great marriage. You might have a disaster. You might be suffering. But it's why did I get married? Well, to serve God in that state. But with this person. Obviously, if you see issues before, well, you have to deal with them before. Uh, but once you've made that sacrifice, well, you've got to work with that framework. I'm, I'm not going to cover that uh, in today. But... Uh, What's the foundation of why are you here? What's the purpose? That has to be the fundamental. And the first thing St. Ignatius says in the Ignatian Retreat, why was I made? And and that's the whole problem of the modern world. No clue about what they're here, what purpose they are. All they're focused on, all they're saturated with is uh, just get as much pleasures out of life as you can. And as again, a point I made on last uh, few Sundays ago, that it's ironic that we live in a world that we are far more richer, far more materially blessed than many of our ancestors would have ever been, and yet we have the most uh, highest rate of mental illnesses in, in the whole of human history. Uh, it, it hasn't made us better, even on a purely natural level. It hasn't made us happier. Most people are on antidepressants. It's a vast majority. It's not like a small number. Uh, they're not happy. They're not happy, and they're mentally unstable. Why is that? Because these material things have not given the answer. It's once the more go away from God, they become more and more unstable, more and more uh, unhappy. And it's only 
by laying down our life that we actually uh, uh, become happy. Uh, you know, sometimes we can be have this e- illusion about the religious life. And, and I want to say something, whether it's your religious or whether you're getting married, the formation begins the day that you are born. And the formation is done ultimately by the parents. That's why this is so important. Because your, your holiness is the formation you receive in the years before you get married or before you become a, a priest. So uh, the priest who's formed by good parents, good habits, it becomes a natural thing for them to pray, to be generous, to be giving, uh, to be sacrificial, because that was the part of their whole life. So it wasn't, it's not a radical change for them. Uh, you don't become a good priest the day you're ordained. That's, that's a lie. You become a, a good priest in your early years of laying down your life. When you come to be married or religious, you actually have to bring something to the table. And I'm not talking about the money you bring. I'm talking about the person. Often you see this with people. They, they have a romantic idea, and there's hardly anyone you'll ever meet, who doesn't have a romantic idea of a spouse that they want. Well, yeah, and it's so fantastic that that spouse doesn't even exist. It's never going to exist, okay? And I understand that, but they never say to themselves, how about I be that uh, spouse? How about I be that person um, that I'm looking for? They don't. They have a romantic idea. And yet the, the Bible says a, a, a good wife is given in proportion to a man for his fear of God and good deeds. Well, So you're expected to come to the party as a virtuous person. I, I remember one, one young girl, I, I was just very frustrated with her and her life. And I, I said, well, what, what do you want from your life? And never happy, always dissatisfied. My father, I just would like to get married. And I said, look, my dear friend, I hate to tell you, no man in their right mind would ever marry you. And I would hate to think that they would. And she was a bit shocked. But why are you saying that? Because you're absolutely selfish. Uh, what do you think marriage is about? Like, you're going to have to start cooking, cleaning, dishes. Doing uh, uh, nappies is not fun. You've got a romantic idea, and then you're going to be in that idea, and you're going to be miserable. If now we ask you to do the dishes, and you think it's a big deal, what do you think when you do when you get married? It's, it's um, your idea is romantic. It's like one of our priests said to me the other day. He said to me very bluntly, you know, he went and did a sick call and, and was able to give a sacrament to some young boy. And he said, some days our life is is great as priests, but most days it's horrible. And he's, he's right. We don't do anything great. It's pretty boring, you know. I, I think sometimes, you know, if the husband comes home and he says to his wife, "Honey, what did you do?" Sometimes you, the wife might want to slap him because she probably did everything under the sun and, and uh, cook, clean, scrub, and he's like, well, what did my wife do? Well, well, n- nothing. She's lazy. Well, no, she did everything, but it's not something to write a book about. Oh, I did dishes. I did, did the laundry. It's, it's not something you're going to make a romance novel out of. Uh, you know, so for me, one of the hardest questions is either when one of the faithful or the spirit say, oh, what did you do today? Well, everything and nothing. Well, nothing. I'm gonna. It's gonna be interesting to you, <laughs> but you know, it is all boring stuff. I don't. We don't do uh, very glamorous things normally. It's just boring, humdrum. Uh, but it is. It is important. But at the end of the day, it's not something I'm gonna say. Well, you know, I did this. No, I didn't. You fall asleep. I prayed my prayers. I wrote, I wrote to this person. I prepared a schedule. Mass. It, it doesn't. It's not something uh, that is glamorous. And we are always looking for the entertainment in life and uh, there's no entertainment it's actually life is really humdrum and boring and it is a, a, when you're serving sadhas not only is it boring it's absolutely painful and uh, it's received uh, with ingratitude uh, the, the, your, your spouse probably complaining uh, everyone's complaining and sulking and never happy and the, this is not good enough that's, that, that's the life yeah it's not it's not um, glamorous life but that's the life that um, we actually are embracing. Uh, you know, we, 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 we priests, we always make the same point. Our superiors, whenever they call us up, we always got this something in our stomach that says, oh, no, what have I done wrong now? You know, they're never going to call up and say, oh, you know, really, we just want to thank you for that great job you did. Or it's going to call you up and, yeah, you know, so-and-so complained. Oh, no, it's just, oh, what have I done now? Um, and, and that's life. It's not where somebody will say, yeah, thank you for, for what you did. It's not 
it's not going to happen. It's, it's, uh, and, and look, you know, uh, if we, we see it out in the Missouri, for me, the real heroes are our nuns. They, they live a total life of, uh, and we, we used to say in the past, one of the marks of the, the Catholic Church is from God, is we have women living together, you know. It's something divine. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, they live together, they, they work together, and they don't, the day's just full of prayer, work. Yeah, they get some time for rest and some time for recreation, but they almost don't waste a minute. Um, and they don't have Netflix, they don't, there's no internet, there's no TV for them. Um, it's a very strict life, but it's a, it's a life of sacrifice. That's a heroic life. And they are not, they're not, you, know, you don't see people singing their praises. They're just boring nuns who just dress in black, you know. Uh, but that's the life that they are offered and joyfully and cheerfully and generously offered day in, day out. Uh, you, you see them day in, day out, day in, day out. That's that's a life. That's it's not romantic. Uh, uh, it's not the Hollywood concept of life. And, and I just said to a friend of mine, notice the difference between almost every single uh, American movie uh, uh, and, a, and a Chinese movie. American movie, the hero almost always wins and comes back to life. Right? In a Chinese movie, the hero almost always dies. Why? Because the Chinese are saying that some things they're worth dying for. Some things, it's, it, you have become glorious in your death, not in your life. And laying down that life, that's a concept that's foreign to us. Uh, for us, we think, oh, it's a, it was pointless. Well, what did he do? Well, no, it wasn't pointless. It's extremely amazing. But it was a life of unsung sacrifice. And that's, you know, that's what mothers and fathers and priests and nuns, that's what they do. That's what our life is. And that's what we are called to look at, that life of sacrifice. And maybe it's not, and I don't mean it in a sadistic sense, uh, because you see the nuns and you see, obviously you see the priests. We are very content, we're very happy, very cheerful, we are grateful, um, and the same thing in a good family. The mothers and fathers, they lay down their life, but overall, the children should be happy, the parents should be happy. It's a life of dedication, a life of continual sacrifice, mortification of our will. Uh, it, it is not easy uh, to do that, and it, it's becoming harder and harder to do that because the spirit of the world has eaten our hearts. We, we are we are all liberals. There's no one none of us here that is not because we are born in this liberal spirit around us, and we have in, imbibed the spirit of the world uh, today, whether we like to admit it or not. We all have that, all of us. There's none none of us that haven't. We are brought up in this world, and it takes years and years and years to slowly begin to take it out of us, and then to hopefully impart the right spirit in, in those around us. That takes, that takes a lot of uh, dedication, time, sacrifice. Uh, it's not easy. And especially when we don't see any real um, glorification. For, I mean, even still today, we, in the society, a lot of our chapels are still uh, insignificant and small and uh, sort of half dead, a lot of them. Uh, there's no, there's no real great glory in a lot of uh, our chapels, uh, but that's our, you know, we go to uh, all these outback mass centers of ten people. You, you can think, uh, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> uh, is this what I've given my life for? You can think that, and it's understandable uh, because that's the life that mother and father could say that too. What have I, um, you know, you, you, you work your, your life, you sacrifice and. Is this what I've given my life for? And you can, you can rightly uh, start to uh, question that. We can uh, start to uh, feel the, the, the crucifixion. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, you know, we, we have to uh, die to ourselves. And today, people, we have to admit, are more and more immature, which means uh, I understand and it's probably more prudent to delay more and more a little bit uh, getting married or even entering the religious life. Some exceptions, but I think it's better sometimes for them to go work in the world, uh, to be buffeted by the world, to know the value of things in the world, to get a proper education for their own formation, but also then when they, uh, when they get uh, in the religious life or the married life, they have something to offer. Uh, I was a doctor, I was an accountant, I was a lawyer. This is my expertise. And I can share it. Uh, I was educated. I can share it with those around me, my, either my parishioners, my children, my, my spouse. Uh, I've got something solid to offer. And I, I've shown my, my value in my worth in putting up 
with and being crucified by the world and understanding the value of things. Uh, uh, you know, if you've never worked a day in your life, you obviously don't really understand the real value of what it, what it costs you to, to earn a living and to uh, when somebody gives you a donation, what sacrifice they have had to make to, to give you uh, that donation. So it's important, I think, more and more to address the reality of, of our, the immaturity of, our, of people in general. And that's why you notice in our seminaries, originally it was like three years formation, then it went to five years, uh, then it went to six years, and now it's seven years, seven years in the seminary. Why? Because the first year is just looking at the, the world, the reality around you, uh, from purely a uh, natural point of view, understanding uh, a little bit of the humanity subjects, uh, uh, the classics, just forming your mind uh, a little bit in how to deal with people. The next year, spiritual life, spirituality, a bit more deeper formation. Then the next five years, you go to philosophy, then to theology. So seven years of the spiritual life, seven years of the religious life. Before, in the sixth year, you make that, that commitment as a deacon and then you get ordained as a priest. You get all that time to prepare. Unfortunately, before you get married, you don't do all six, seven years. And you, you, you don't have a lot of time, but your, prepare, your preparation time is that time before you get married. And I can't insist on that point enough because that's what you come into the marriage with. You come in uh, to it with what you've formed of yourself. So if I can say, maybe scandalize you a bit, not when I was uh, as parish priest in a number of different places, People would come to me, Father, we want to get married, and they'd already booked everything, ready to get married. Sorry, I'm not marrying you. Uh, we'll delay it one year. Some person, I delayed it two years because uh, immaturity. Sorry, on both sides, often, both sides uh, were immature. And one boy said, Father, well, I'm not sure what you expect from me. I said, very simple. You know, in a football game, normally somebody kicks the ball, and the other people, they take the ball and they chase it and they get to the other side. He said, yeah, Well, what do you mean? Oh, I expect you to take responsibility for your faith, for your life, show maturity. And then, then I can say, oh, you're a mature person, ready for uh, the reality and the uh, uh, responsibility of marriage. If not, then why, why would I support something that's going to be a disaster? Why, why would I punish uh, your spouse or the future children uh, when I can see a disaster in front of me? And I would ne not let that happen. No, no way. Uh, so I, you, you've got to you've got to correct it, and uh, they they came to the they're free to go to somewhere else. They are free, but then I don't have that responsibility. Uh, in the in the good old days, mothers and fathers did that for us. They would say, Johnny, you're not ready. You're, you're immature. Yeah, uh, you, 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 mentally, you're not stable. You got to correct that because then you got later the responsibility of someone else. Uh, same thing as a priest. If somebody enters the priesthood and is not mentally stable, he doesn't belong there. But at least he's got five years under a priest to say, look, uh, we think you're, you're not a stable table and you, or, or you are stable, but you just don't have a vocation. It's a different story. But somebody who comes in, and normally in the past, there are a fair few uh, religious groups that would accept, but if you came in and you were not well, in fact, in the past, they were even stricter. If you came in and you had a lisp or you had a missing finger, they were very strict. No, because you're, you're going to be in public display of the church. Little things that often, or your parents... Uh, uh, were were uh, adulterous, often very strict in the past. I'm not saying that we apply all that, but the church was very strict on who she received in the seminary and who she ordained. Because once you're ordained, you place the weight of the world on that person's shoulders. You want to make sure that they are able to bear that weight. So the same thing in marriage. You've got heavy responsibility of a spouse and possible children. The church in the past used to uh, used to take very serious those who are getting married and, and, and weigh up, uh, are they ready? If not, no, we, we are. And, and the key thing often was maturity and responsibility. Same thing in the room, maturity, responsibility. And today, there is a lack of any uh, maturity, responsibility, and therefore lack of any willingness to accept accountability. And you see this globally. You see this point globally. Uh, and it's a very sad thing. And, and my point is just simply disillusion you from uh, the concept that we have today. And if you see that you, your, your future spouse is, doesn't have a sense of duty, responsibility, accountability, a sign of, uh, it's a red flag, you walk away. If you, don't, you don't say, I'm going to embrace that and I'll, 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 I will help them through that. No, you don't. You don't do that. Because you're there to help each other get to heaven. You're there to help each other 
to uh, carry the cross. Don't, uh, you're not there to carry the cross for the other person and that's it. No, you help each other carry the cross. And they have to be, uh, if you see red flags, you walk away. If you're married, too late. You, you've got to stick with it. Uh, that's, uh, that's your, and same thing with the priest. You often you hear priests today, oh, I realized after I got ordained, it wasn't for me. Uh, too late. You got married, you got ordained. You're stuck for life. That's your duty and your response. I know what I'm saying is hard. It's not what, what we would like. I oh, just go appeal to the Vatican, they lay aside you, and you'll be free. That's not the spirit of, of our faith. You know, in the past, and, and take this for a spin, in the past, your word, you just your word, was my, a friend of mine who was a builder. He said to me, if I wanted to loan from the bank, I just went to the bank, I gave him my word. That was all that, I, and they gave me the money. Because in the past, a person's word was their life, their value. For me, my word means more than my life. I'm not going to break my word because my word is everything I stand for. You gave your word to God before the altar for this person or that vocation. That's your word. You don't go back. You choose death rather than go back on your word. It doesn't matter. You bargain, you make an agreement with somebody. You realize later, uh, maybe I didn't make a good deal. Too bad. You made your word. You have a duty to have thought about it, to consider it. But you gave your word. Your word means something. And that's important for us. Again, the world of, and you see this all the time. Unfortunately, you see it all the time. Person makes an appointment. Father, I'm coming. Ten minutes before they text you, I'm not coming. But hold on. It's only in the modern world where you can do that and show that uh, basically rude manners of not being faithful to your commitment. It's quite sad. But accountability, responsibility, duty, out the window. That, that's a lost concept. And yet, that's the very foundation of our life as Catholics. Our duty, responsibility. It's not a life of, uh, of games and entertainment. Uh, it's here, uh, you know, the, the husband and wife, the religious, our commitment is yeah, founded on sacrifice, but with the supernatural reality of the help of the Holy Ghost. And if we exclude the supernatural reality, yeah, we are heading for disaster. If we exclude the spiritual life, we exclude the prayer life, we exclude uh, God as the foundation, well, we have a society like we do today. Because without God, humanly speaking, it is not possible. Your, your human love um, is often going to last as long as your feelings last. And feelings often don't last that long. It's just the reality. And, and, and people can, because you know, when you marry someone, same thing in the religious life, but it's easier to give the comparison from the religion, from the married life. When you marry someone, you don't marry their face, their legs, their arms. You marry the whole person. And the person comes uh, as a package. And that package includes their whole history, their whole formation, uh, or the lack of. And that brings a lot of, with it. And you're embracing that. And both sides are embracing that. And, and, and that's the same thing in the religious life. You know, you can get great superiors or you can get uh, superiors that can make your life hell on earth. Uh, that's just the reality. It's part of our life. Uh, it's part of the life that we, we offer to God, better or worse. It's the this, this sacrifice. It doesn't mean that, uh, that I'm saying that we, we, we think this, we tell the spirit you're fantastic when they're not, or, or the husband or the wife. But what I am saying is that it's a reality on both sides. You embrace the package deal with all of its good points, bad points, it's, uh, and, and you, you have to be willing to acknowledge that, prepare your mind for that, accept that, uh, but God uh, is there to help us in that. Now, I've given you a lot of food for thought. If you have any specific uh, questions, uh, you can shoot away. Uh, if not, I uh, can leave you. Yeah, go ahead. We're going to cover that in detail. And Father will go into a lot of detail on that. So courtship essentially is for marriage. It's not for a fun time. Uh, it's not to feel good. I know the whole world today is, is all about that, but essentially courtship, is per main purpose is for marriage. Yeah, look, uh, a lot of the, um, yeah, the, this long courtship mentality, 
It's not a Catholic concept. There, there can be exceptions for exceptional reasons, but generally, and I can give so many examples, it, it's not a good thing, it's not healthy, um, and you're essentially, the more you prolong it, you're taking advantage of the other person's life, which could have been fruitful with someone else if you're not going to marry them. So I think it's a bit unfair, and uh, taking advantage of the other person, even if they, they're happy for you to do that, it's still not right either. Uh, well, we don't, because the church has never set uh, historically a specific time frame. She's always said your, your dating, your courtship is for the purpose of marriage. It shouldn't take long uh, for you to work, is this person for me? To marry. And in the past, to be fair to the modern people, in the past that was easier to determine because in the past, in, in most towns, you knew the person, you knew their parents, you know the whole history of the family. So both families basically had, a, had an idea of who is the person that they are realistically marrying because they knew basically their background, their history, uh, which, they, which unfortunately you don't have a lot of today. Um, but this is, that point is another important point, that when you are courting someone, very important that you do get to know them in their proper setting. What are they like in their family? What are their family like? What is the mother like? What is the father like? Because they're more likely going to come out either like their mother or father. Uh, and if you don't like what you see in their mother and father, in general, I say to people, walk away. Because that's in general what you're actually, in general, there are some exceptions, and there, there are exceptions, but that's generally what your spouse is going to be like on a natural level. If with God's grace they're willing to change and, and and, and uh, uh, conform to become a better person, which they, in general, people should be. Uh, but the reality is what you see is the apple and the tree are, are related. So that help, should help you be realistic. So this modern dating where we go out as boy and girl without the framework of their family, it's a recipe for disaster if it continues for a long period of time because you're seeing them outside of their real context. Anyone can dress up and put on makeup and look good, but in the family setting, you see whether they are good and you see the whole family because the apple and the tree are very often related. It's very rare that they're not related. So it's so important, that point of the family, uh, the, 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 the wider context, their work setting, the, that, that whole village mentality um, is so important. What are they putting on Facebook, their social media account? Well, that's so important to look at. Because you, this is the package that you're taking on. To be naive about it um, is, is something that uh, is disastrous for you. Why would you, something that is the biggest investment you're going to make in your entire life. Uh, it's very, all those things are important. Uh, so you want to look at all those things. You, you, do, you do that when you're buying a car. Well, there's somebody you're going to be married to for the rest of your life. A car you can chuck in a rubbish bin. You can't do that with your spouse. So you want to check out, you want to see what they're, not the facade, because it's easy for me or anyone to put on a facade, that's an easy thing, uh, but what are they actually like, what are their real values, what are their real focuses, uh, uh, what are, they, are they really generous, really sacrificing, are they really dedicated to the other, or is it that they're just egotistical, uh, and, and you have to look, check out all that, with the, see what the family is like, see what their social media is like, see, all, all those things are, are very important things, uh, to have a realistic, a realistic outlook on the person that you are uh, wanting to marry. Uh, we have to be realistic. It, so it, it, and, and being realistic is, um, is important for us because later on when you're upset, when you're sad, um, we, we don't uh, have someone else to blame but ourselves. And I think once God was kind enough to show you all those signs and you're upset, well, I think you kind of partly deserve what, because you refuse to see what God showed you, your neighbor showed you, and you were stubborn um, and you didn't want to hear it. Well, once you're stuck with it, you, are, you have to embrace it. It's too late at that point. Yeah, look, even, I'll be honest with you. So, so villages, certain villages are known what their men are like, all right? The men in some villages are known to be tough and have no compassion on their women. So the women, 
in those valid villi other villages we know we don't marry men from those villages but the men from the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other villages would know we do marry their women because their women are great but their men we don't we have nothing to do with them because they have that same trait of lack of understanding compassion and they just think it's normal because they've grown up to think it's normal and, and that's not normal uh, uh, it's secular or worldly or uh, Islamic um, uh, or pagan ideas that have formed part of the culture and which unfortunately the modern clergy will not correct for anything. But in the past, the clergy did uh, correct all that, uh, uh, that slow creep in of pagan ideas and cultures into Christian uh, families and, and towns and villages, which, which have, because all of them worldwide in general were, were impacted either by Protestants or by um, uh, Muslims or even by Jews, and in that interacting, we they embraced ideas which are foreign. Uh, uh, the, the, for example, even the Jewish concept of uh, of the way they treat the women, uh, it's not our concept. It's far superior, far more beautiful, far more respectful. And our, our model is Our Lady. It's far more different. Uh, it's worlds apart. So uh, their their customs, their ideas, once they they creep in. But as far as as far as the men. Um, I often used to say to people, look at the mother and take the daughter. What does that mean? If the mother is great, the daughter in general, few exceptions, is going to be great. If the mother is no good, the daughter in general is going to be no good. It's just the general fact. Yeah? Because the apple and the tree are, uh, are related. Sometimes the daughter comes out like the father, and that's, there, are, there are exceptions. But usually they come out like the mother. And that's not a bad thing, because if the mother's great, the daughter's great. If the mother's not great, the daughter in general, because they emulate what they see as a woman in the only woman that they're always around, their mother. And that's just the normal thing. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a prejudice, it's just the reality. Uh, and you, you can see that. If you go back and um, look, even look at the way, if you want to be even more, you know, look at the way a, a good woman has dedication to her house. Look at the, I remember seeing a woman just chopping uh, tomatoes and I said to her, just from the way you're chopping those tomatoes, I can tell you're worth your weight in gold. Because you'd think she was doing it for some five-star restaurant. She's doing it for her family. Spot on, lot minute detail, perfect. And they're going to eat it in less than five seconds. But, but why that dedication? Because it's, it's their way of showing their love, their dedication, their sacrifice. Maybe it's insignificant. No one's going to notice. But for her, it's everything everything that's that's someone who who's giving their heart their love through their laying down their time if you, you know a lot of the eastern meals it take five hours to prepare five hours to cook and it's eaten in half an hour and you think what's the point of that well for the person it's it's a joy it's an honor it's a dedication it's a sacrifice it, it's a love for someone else from looking at it from a natural point of view what an absolute waste of time and stupidity okay yeah totally ridiculous but it, it's the concept that is from worlds apart, worlds apart, and and they they would never understand that, and we would never understand what they're talking about. We, for us, yeah, but that's normal. That's what, that's what we do because that's that's our duty. That's what we love to do. This. So worlds apart, and it should be worlds apart, and, and we should think like that. It's a joy. It's you know the, the nuns. They spend all those hours. The flowers, you know, in the end, the flowers are going to die. What's the point? Well, it's for our Lord. It's a sacrifice. It's a joy. It's an honor, privilege. And you know they they put so much detail and they spend hours and hours. You, you think they're like little kids, but they have such big hearts, and that's a beautiful thing for them. It's a joy for them. It's not a burden for them because they're serving the one they love. Same thing for us with our spouses. Right? It, yeah, okay, they can be painful and okay, but we love them at the end of the day, uh, and, uh, and then it all makes. Uh, we love them from a supernatural point of view in the sense that, our, and, and this is a very key point. Often. You see people before they get married and they're head over heels for each other. And for me, that is a recipe for disaster. A recipe for disaster. Especially when you see one is so clingy. Because those people will turn on you like the wind. Uh, they love you. It's so uh, over the moon. And the next day, uh, it's because it was all based on their feelings and emotions. It was disordered. It wasn't based on a laying down my life, an ordered, a self uh moderated it wasn't it was based on a disordered um self-love and, and i don't want to talk too much on that because the father's going to 
we will cover all the different priests will cover different topics in in more detail so unless yes and and, and the, the key way and I'll say to the women that the guy in general and there are exceptions again but when I say exception exception only confirm the rule an example is you, sometimes you've got to drive on the opposite side of the road if a car is coming at you but that confirms the norm. The norm is to drive on the normal side of the road. So the, the men are usually going to be the best they're at in their life before you marry them. And if they are terrible before you marry them, don't marry them. Very simple. Very simple. Uh, the only exception is when, and I've seen it, beautiful women have said to them, uh, look, you want to marry them, not a problem, but you've got to wise up uh, and you've got to shape up. And if you're not going to do that, sorry, we, we're not, not going anywhere. So use that time there to say, okay, wise up. Get a, get a proper job, uh, get a proper education, get a brain, use it and apply it, and then we can look at getting married. Until then, um, I love you. Very beautiful person. Thank you for the offer, but it's, I'm, not, I'm not going down that road. So use that time when you, you can almost get them to do anything because they're in love and it's, it's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. So use it to your advantage. Um, get them to come to church with you. Get them to come to catechism. They might just be squirming in their seat. It's all right. Um, but you you can you can get them out of that, and that's what I said to those the couple. I said, Look, I'm not marrying you because you're both immature and you're both unstable. And unless I see responsibility, accountability, and maturity, we're not going down. And and it is disaster. So I I'm not supporting it. But I, I could, in some cases it's not so always clear, especially if I don't know the background. But in this case I knew the family background and history because I taught them when they were little. So I knew them growing up. I know their families. Disaster. This is going to be a disaster recipe. I am not going to support it. So until I see commitment, responsibility, accountability, um, they were happy with each other as they were. I was not. Sorry. It's not. It's, it's horrible. Um, and it's not from anything I know. From It's everything from the outside. Uh, from the outside, sorry, what I see is you're not responsible, you're not accountable, you're not mature. It's disaster. I'm not supporting that on both sides. So shape up, wise up, then come back and... And if ever, all the other priests can say that, yeah, they've, they've shown maturity, accountability, well, good, not a problem. And I never base it just on what I feel. I check with the other priests, you know, this, they check with their families, I check with everyone, and then I make a decision. I don't just sort of say, oh, I, I personally think, no, I'll check with everyone. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I check with the community, uh, that is, the parents, the priests, the, those who know them. Am, is my assessment right? Or if I'm mistaken, I'm glad to be enlightened. Maybe oh, there's things that I don't see, but... When I can, after checking with everyone, I can see, yep, I'm on the mark, then I'll say no. And they, they, you also can do the same. You say, okay, I'll check with his parents, or check with the priest, check with the people around him, see his work friends, uh, see his social media page. It all looks a bit uh, childish or uh, no, just silly or, or, or blank-minded. There's no depth. Well, no, no, that has to be changed or no, that's not what I want. So you do have a lot of things, but... Use that love that they have towards you to pull them. Uh, so, you know, on a, on a good side of that, a lady, I, I know she, she waited many years to, before she would marry someone, but eventually she, she met a guy and he was a, he was a pagan, a, a non-Catholic, but he was a very good man, very good man on a natural level, um, uh, very honest, upright, hardworking man. And I said to her, yeah, I think he, he should marry this man. He's a good man on a natural level. Um, I spoke to him. I said, listen, we're not going to force you to become Catholic, but I think it's a good for you thing to just to look into it. He said, okay, I'll look into it. He said, yeah, it makes sense. I, I would like to become Catholic. So I went through the whole process and, and, and baptized him before they got married. But what I said at his wedding day is a very important point. I said, look, you know, in life, when you, when you make a decision, whether it's in the uh, playground, uh, football, in a judge, uh, in a court, the, the judgment you make for anything uh, and it also applies when you judge, should I marry this person? The judgment partly says something about you. And I said of him that his judgment, he looked at this girl, good girl, uh, upright person, got values, morals, uh, I'll take this girl. He looked at the Catholic faith, he says, yeah, it makes sense. It's, it, it, it's something beautiful, I, I, I choose it. So he, he had a sense of, of natural goodness that allowed him to judge objectively and clearly and make the right decisions. And, and hopefully, you should be the same. You've got your faith, your parents, the, the, the whole community around you that gives you the right perspective 
So you can, when you're going to make that important choice, whether for religious or for um, for married life, you've got all the, the tools you need to make the right decision. And that's why it's so important to have good priests and good parents. Because if you, the standard by which you should judge things in the world is by the goodness of your parents. They're, they're the first model. So for example, I was... So a child who's brought up with good music, as soon as he hears the modern music, he's going to say, this is noise, it's horrible, disgusting. But if he's brought up with his whole life is, is bad music, he's just going to think this is cool, it's great. Somebody whose parents don't know how to cook, they don't cook food, and then he goes to McDonald's and says, this is great. But, but he's been fed garbage, so he doesn't, can't distinguish between good food and garbage. Uh, it's the same thing for us. If, if we're going to be able to judge right, it's so important to have good parents, good teachers, good priests, to form us in a good mind. So then when we see the good, we can judge it for the good. When we see the bad, we can judge it for the bad. So important, so important for us. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that unless you've got any questions. Uh, yeah, so we'll leave it at that and we'll end with a prayer. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, God without end. Uh, Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, St. Thomas Aquinas. A benedictio deum de parentes, patris et de sangue, sine super vos, et maniat semper amen.